have done more done more in your own lifespan and thinking that we're done my life's complete i've done it all no sir no miss there is still more you have to do more work to need to be done whether you have the promotion having the the beautiful family graduate bought your own dream thing like you know car house etc or business you, you know how it, you know what i'm saying there's that little bit of a happy happiness happiness in that moment but you know life is a sports game you have one shot one chance and one opportunity to seize the moment which is why I guess who is a real estate broker, a salesman, and an entrepreneur who always keep a positive mind and always keep moving forward. My man, Frank Spalding Bay. Frank, here's the floor. So Frank, I brought you on this segment <clears throat> to talk about the, about no no finish line, like one one goal is done but there's still more to done i want to ask you the first question like what are the plans on on the accomplished goal like is it okay to sit back or you know you got to grind grind for more well you know funny being an associate real estate broker i've grown up in a culture where i was taught that the best time to close a deal is right after you close the deal and really that's to take advantage of the momentum of you know, starting the deal, getting the clothes, getting the check, you know, it's always a rewarding feeling. And once you're on that level of a high, if you will, and being compensated, you know, you now have the momentum to spring forward and go after the next deal. Because, you know, when you first do a deal, so much work may go into it, you know, the legwork, the calling, the soliciting, the appointment, then the showing of a property, then finally, getting title cleared to get a closing and during that time you know you may or may not have the financial resources that you may have you may have to work another job in conjunction with that you know but maybe when you finally close that real estate deal you know you get a little more financial breathing room or maybe even put you in a position where you could no longer have to maybe work that other job and you can focus full time on making more deals. So you don't want to let that momentum go to waste or the wind in your sail to expire before you really jump on repeating that process a multiplicity of times to put you on the other side of money. Right. But what about, you know, life itself? I mean, I talk not only about a job thing, like, like life itself, you know, when you complete the what the life goal, but <clears throat> there's one more, there's one more you may not know, how, you may not know that you have to complete. Will it get more harder? Well, you know, it's just so funny. Um, you know, you, when I went to college, I, I went there to study economics and finance, but I think I spent more time studying baseball because I played college baseball and I was thinking about your questions in preparation for this conversation. And I, the process of playing baseball came to mind. You know, in baseball, there are nine innings and whoever gets to 27 outs first wins the game. And within those nine innings, you know, you have three quarters, if you will, the first three innings, then the next six innings, then the final nine innings, you know, so the game can be broken up in thirds. You can have a seventh inning stretch, you know, which is kind of like the halfway period of the game, if you will. And so throughout the ebb and flow of the game, you know, there may be lead exchanges. There may be a point where you're losing so much that the game is already lost before it's over, or you may be so way ahead that you may be blowing out the other team, you know, and I've experienced all those kind of games on the winning side and on the losing side. And when the game is over, it's over. You know, sometimes the game may go into extra inning, in innings rather, because right. it's tied <clears throat> and a final outcome got to be determined. So 
this idea of relaxing, working harder, you know, when I look at it, I can liken a baseball game to life because we live in stages and quarters of our lives. You know, when we're young, we're being taught and prepared to be on our own one day. Then finally we get on our own. And then that time when we're on our own, we're working and amassing assets to be able to take care of ourselves when we're going to no longer work. And depending upon how well we play that game can really determine how well of an outcome we can have and if we can relax or if we have to continue working. You know, will our work work for us or do we have to continue to work to maintain ourselves? So it's all about a perspective. It's all about an attitude. It's all about maybe sometimes some intervention, someone that can come in and see us and see what we're doing, that can offer us some <clears throat> advice, that can really put us on the path to being free, you know, financially, mentally, physically, emotionally, you know, based on our talents and the things that we choose to do in life. You know, someone may come along and see that we have a gift and in developing that gift, you know, how, how can we get the most out of it to get the most out of our lives? That, <clears throat> that, I, that I agree with. But that pants me this, though. Mm -hmm. Based on baseball, based on life, you have three strikes, and if you blew all three of them, you're out. Meaning that you lost the opportunity. Did that happen to you or no? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and, um, and after that third strike, I may walk <laughs> away thinking about the sequence of strikes that got me walking back to the dugout. I'm like, wow, that guy overpowered me with his fastball. Or, you know what, he set me up with a curve, and I wasn't expecting it, or... You know, maybe mechanically I pulled my head off the pitch or, you know, I didn't do the right thing. I wasn't in the right mental frame of mind. So really at every at bat, you want to step up to the plate knowing what your objective is. You know, the objective for me when I was hitting the baseball was to try to get to the inside part of the ball with the sweet part of the bat so I can make the best contact to hopefully get on base or maybe, or maybe even put it out of the park. And, um, you know, and the thing is, coming up, I was known as a power hitter. But as I got older and faced better competition, you know, people know how to, you know, go after the weaknesses or the holes of a power hitter because we're always looking to put the ball over the wall. But if you come with the Derek Jeter approach, which is what I like to call it. The Derek Jeter know, approach. The Derek Jeter approach, hit the inside part of the ball and <clears> hit <throat> the opposite field. You give yourself more opportunity to get on base because if you're a right-handed hitter and you're shooting to the right side of the field, you automatically open up the left side of the field to you to hit as well because now you're hitting in a way that you've expanded the field instead of being a right-handed hitter and wanting to pull it down the left field line to get that home run. You have now limited the amount of field that you're going to use to be able to get on base safely. You know, this is a team sport. You know, we would all like to go up there and hit home runs every time, but statistically that's just not possible. But the thing is, how can we be a consistent hitter where we're constantly on the base, base paths in life? Because when you're in the game and you're constantly on the base paths, that means you're always threatening the score. But if you're at the plate and there's no one on base and you're looking to constantly hit the ball over the wall, and you don't do that all the time. You're not as big a threat to being able to succeed at your goal. So the thing is, you constantly want to be in the game. You constantly want to be on the base paths because that's where the game is won. The more people get on base and come across home, or the more runs that are scored in a better position, you put yourself in to win. So really every day, I want to find that way to be in the game every day. So even for me, in conjunction with being a real estate broker, I'm also a Walmart associate. So for me, being in the game every day at Walmart means coming to work every day, never calling out, never being late, and, you know, meeting and exceeding expectations of getting the job done that I'm expected to do. So I'm constantly in the game because <clears throat> my reward is getting a check every two weeks. And the bigger award yeah. is the opportunity of maybe advancing to higher levels of management so I could be more valuable and get a bigger check, you know, by simply being in the game, showing up, never calling out, and being positive and rallying my coworkers to also see that vision for themselves. Because from small things come big things. 
you know, a snowball going downhill can become a big avalanche, you know, but you got to start somewhere and it all starts at the bottom and you work your way up, but you got to get on base. That's the key. And then trying to get on base, you just might happen to put it over the wall and, and get to come straight <clears> home. <throat> but that only happens when you come to the game. You know what I mean? No matter how undermanned you may feel or under the weather or imposed or imposing it may be, you never know. Just by swinging the bat and putting the ball and putting the bat on the ball, what can happen? Good things can happen. You can look for a base hit, but the ball can fly out the park, you know? Just because you did the right things, the basics, mm -hmm. mastery of the basics. And that's all Jerry Dita did. He was never a flashy player. But he just did the basic thing day in and day out, and it got him into the Hall of Fame. Out of all of the great Yankees that played, he has the most hits of any Yankee that ever played. And you all know the, the great names that played the Yankees. Joe Maggio, Babe Ruth, Reggie Jackson, Mickey Mantle. But he's the number one hit guy for them. <laughs> better than A-Rod? Listen, I'm not. Better than A-Rod? Better than A-Rod. <laughs> he, and, that, and that's what I respect about you. You, you come to work every day. There's no, your mind says no slacking. You just had to push, ho push forward, aim, aim at the game and strike it home. And that's why every day, and that's why everybody's mentality. You have to. Our job is not perfect. Our life's not perfect. We are trying the best as possible to live every day to provide for ourselves, for our family, and just be humble and be blessed that that we that we have a job that that we come to work every day it absolutely. it could be annoying at times but we have to be we have to be gracious absolutely we have to be 100%. we're gracious to be alive and also survive uh that was like a terrible year from last year mm -hmm. and um as you said before life can be the game the game's on the line, and mm -hmm. we have to make sure that we pursue it and win it. Mm -hmm. There was another question, but it it, was, it did not make any sense. But I'm gonna skip the other one. Um, well, you, is that the question? Well, you know, not to interrupt you, but is that the question where it says, uh, "Is there such a thing as a happy ending after completing?" A good when life have more challenges in store for you. Completing is that completing a goal when life. Oh, yeah. right, right. Well, you know what? It's funny. I was taking a look at that as well, and I was thinking about it. You know, uh, and I'm going to take it back to that baseball example. Let's say, you know, and I'm going to use Derek Jeter. Uh, Derek Jeter, 20, 20 year career, Hall of Fame career. Um, he set for life. New York you know? legend all day. Yeah, probably made over a quarter of a billion dollars in earnings, mm -hmm. you know, with his contracts, you know, um, set for life. Don't have to do another thing in life. Yeah, right. But yet, what is the challenge that he presently took on? He took on the challenge of being an owner to, you know, as a owner of the Florida, of the, um, Florida Marlins, mm -hmm. you know, um, even though he has other big money backing him, but he's the day-to-day -day operator of that organization. And so now he wants to take what he did in his playing career and try to duplicate that as an owner to see if he can find that winning formula. You know, um, grow an organization that can resemble his winning career. So um, he didn't have to do that. He's Derek Jeter. You know, um, he's a Hall of Famer. He has money. He doesn't have to work another day in his life. His money will take care of him. But yet, you see, that's that winning spirit. You know, Michael Jordan, same thing. Ultimate winner. Um, what did he do? He went, out and <clears throat> the Carolina, he went out and bought the Carolina Bobcats. Mm -hmm. You know, um, want to try to see if he could recreate that success now as an owner. Because, of course, Father Tom is undefeated. So we can't play the child's game all our life. So he can't go out on court and do it anymore. Derek Jeter can't go out on the field and do it anymore between the white lines. But now you can take your experience, your winning ways, and you can see if you can do it on another level as an owner. So this goes back to what I was saying before. So I'm a Walmart associate now. I work in the back room. I bring products out to the floor, make sure the back room is squared away. And I try to do that at a very high level. 
And so now I look at other opportunities that are available in the store. I'm like, well, hey, I'm a college graduate. You know, I have experience from the military, from working in other industries, from being involved in sports. I want to take my game to a higher level because I feel I have more to offer. And it's the same thing Derek Jeter has said, or it's the same thing Michael Jordan has said. You know what? We have money to take care of ourselves for the rest of our lives and, and many generations after us. But that opportunity now to do it on another level exists and that's what they're doing and so i even look at what i'm doing i'm like you know what i want to take my game to another level you know all right i'm a i'm a successful walmart associate i come to work every day i don't call out i put the work in i, I get a good job done you know i come in i approach it the same way every day what happened yesterday is yesterday today's a new day i gotta replicate it you know, so now I want to take that to another level because now if I can get in the leadership, then I can empower some other people to be the same way. I can empower some people to take a look at some of the opportunities that Walmart is offering mm -hmm. by pursuing education with livebetteryou.com, where they can get an education, you know, via online, still work, be gainfully employed. So while they are building their resume, they can also get their education and you know be able to in a multifaceted way develop themselves and become more valuable you know whether they stay at walmart or they take that experience and that education somewhere else and continue to grow an opportunity for themselves so um yeah i would say that <clears throat> even though you complete a goal you know it could be the end all for you because the goal for Derek Jeter was he wanted to be a baseball player. And he benchmarked that at, at a very high level that he was able to take care of himself and his family and many more generations after him. But now that that goal has been completed, he's embraced a new challenge of being an owner. You know, George Brett has done it with the Kansas City Royals. You know, he spent 20 years in the Kansas City Royal organization. And just a couple of years ago, to my chagrin, he was able to bring a World Series to Kansas City by beating my now beloved New York Mets. I root for the Mets now more so than I do the Yankees. But, you know, he was able to show that a guy who, you know, played his entire career with the Kansas City Royals, did it at a high level, Hall of Famer, can now do it in the front office as the head of baseball operation for the Kansas City Royals. So that's somebody, again, who could, you know, live off of the assets that they've grown over their professional career, but they sought out a new challenge and being able to, uh, as an owner, bring that to another team of players. And I think that's a great thing. You know, when you experience success and you're not able to <laughs> lead success for another group of people who are coming up behind you, who may have seen you play ball as a child. You may have been their idol. You may have been their inspiration. And now you're able to bring something to them that is a beautiful feeling, winning. You know, I remember my baseball coach at Elizabeth City State used to say to me, or say to our team, he said, you know, when I was at Virginia State, we can never get past Norfolk State. Then eventually we got past them. You know, him as a coach there, he won. Um... Then he came to Elizabeth City, he bought a championship there after I left. But his thing was, like he said, I want this for you guys more than you want it for yourselves because you don't know how great it is to win. You know, and I was fortunate enough to be able to see Elizabeth City State win, beat Virginia State, who we, who we could never get past when I was there, and to be able to see those group of guys win. It meant so much because... You know, as a person that came there, got recruited, came there, played ball, tried to put so much into the program to give it respectability, to try to go there and win, and then eventually graduate, and then to see some other guys come behind me, especially a couple of New Yorkers who came behind me and be an integral part of winning meant so much, even though I didn't win with them because I didn't wear the uniform with them between the white lines. But it meant so much to know that they were able to come on – grounds that we built they stood we, they stood on our shoulders even though we didn't win but they came after us and they got it done so when they won it was like they won for all of us they put the school on the map you know all of us that you know worked at it worked at it worked at it couldn't get it done i remember even when i was at fordham university before i went to elizabeth city state i remember when connecticut beat duke in the uh, ncaa 
um, men's division, division one basketball championship. That was big. What year was you that? Know? Um, I want to say that was 98, 98, um, yeah, maybe 98, 99. That's when they had Rip Hamilton, Duke had Elton Brand. And it was so cool because I was at Fordham and some of my um, classmates at the time, we were watching the game. I was the one that had the car at the time. And I said, guys, I said, if UConn win, we're going to drive up there. We're going to celebrate with them. They said, I bet. I had the car, some of my classmates had the money, and we rode up there, and we saw them tear the campus up. And uh, and a side note out of that was, took a couple basketball players with me from Fordham University, and one of them was Steve Canal, who at the time knew Swin Cash, who played at UConn. And I forgot that when we went up there, he had actually knocked on the door of a, ba- of a lady Husky, and she wasn't available. But one of the other players reminded me just this past year that, yeah, that was Steve knocking on Swin Cash's door, and now they're happily married with their second child. And, of course, she's a WNBA Hall of Famer and an executive with the New Orleans team and the NBA and a life well spent. He's doing good things in the inspirational business community. And, you know, that winning formula once again. You know, and um, but the point that I was making about UConn beating Duke was that was UConn's first major national championship. You know, and they had showed the players in the stands who were in the stands prior to them who probably couldn't get past the Elite Eight or the Final Four. Guys like Donye Marshall and and other guys that came before them, and them being in the stands and watching that team win was like they were winning because they were a part of that program and now the program is finally broken through. You know, so in a small way they won because they got a chance to play D1 ball and get a college education and forever be known as guys that play D1 ball at a high level and have moved on with their life. So in that way they won, but they didn't get to take down the net, you know, be able to cut the net after the game. But they were able to see guys who played after them that wore the same uniform they wore, wore rather, cut down those nets. For, so for them, it becomes a win. And it really put things in perspective because you begin to realize, wow, you know, there's a season for everything. And when it's your time, it's your time. You know, even for me this year, uh, maybe the year before Elizabeth City State, I wore the number 24. But there was a player that came after me named Carlos Gutierrez from the Bronx, who also won twenty, wore the number twenty-four, and he had a much, much better statistical playing career than me at Elizabeth City State, and he was a part of that team that won the CIAA championship for Elizabeth City State, and he was enshrined in the uh, Elizabeth City State Sports Hall of Fame. You know, I happen not to be there, but I happen to have had the twenty-four jersey. And when I realized that he had got in the Hall of Fame, I made sure he got those jerseys. It was a home and away uniform. And I made sure he got it because, you know, that should be a part of his archives that he could share and look at and have with his children and all that good stuff. And, you know, and being there at Virginia State when they won and being able to cheer those guys on and even speak to them and encourage them when things wasn't looking too well and he got focused and he got it done. It just shows me that even though I didn't get a chance to do it when I played, but moving forward, taking that same experience and going into other experiences in life where it really matters, career, work, marriage, family, you know, how do I look at those experiences of winning and not winning and how can I bring winning to my work? How can I bring winning to my life? How can I bring winning to my marriage? If and when I get married, how can I bring winning to be a father? How can I bring winning right now to being a good son or a good brother or a good citizen or a good relative? You know, and I think it comes from successes that we have, be it academic, be it athletic, be it entrepreneurial. You know, we can do it across the board. It doesn't mean that because you have experienced success in one arena that you cannot bring that success to other areas of your life. And when you do bring that success to other areas of your life, who else can you bring along for the ride so they can win as well? Right. You know, so when I look at guys like George Brett, who has been able to do it with the Kansas City Royals, 
as a principal chief executive officer of that organization where he played for 20 seasons or a guy like Michael Jordan who's trying to get it done with the Bobcats or a guy like um, LeBron Gary James Chica. how about Le- I mean, well, you know I'm not going to put LeBron James in the conversation because he's still a player his, his, his playing career is not complete yet I mean, and I'm more of a and, and, and also I'm more of a Kevin Durant fan over uh, LeBron James anyway so we'll keep LeBron James out of this one <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that, that was like the, um, the most notable one but, but you're right but you're right I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> well, a LeBron fan, but you have to respect like what you I did. I tell you what, let's take a look at Magic Johnson. Magic Johnson wasn't able to bring success to the Los Angeles Lakers when he was a part of the ownership, but he was able to bring it to the Los Angeles Dodgers. You're right. Just this past season. You're right. You know, um, Isaiah Thomas didn't get it done with the New York Knicks, but Anthony uh, Dumars was able to get it done with the Detroit Pistons as a general manager. You know, when they beat the LA Lakers that year with Ben Wallace and notably Rip Hamilton, once again from UConn. I tell you what, um, a study needs to be done about Rip Hamilton because he won on the college level and he won on the collegiate level, you know, and I'm thinking of the other player that they had there who used to be Mr. Basketball out of Detroit. I'm looking at him right now, but his name is... Chauncey Billups or... No, nah, not Chauncey Billups. It was the other brother. He's like a 6'8", 6'9", swing forward, power forward. Can't remember his name right now. Good Wall- ball player. Rashid Wallace or? Not Rashid Wallace. I'm trying to think of the other brother's name. It'll come to me. But, you know, and I think about all those guys now. All those guys are out of the game. And they're probably very well contented with what they've done. You know, I, I think Rip Hamilton appears sometimes as color commentary. I know Chauncey Billups does. You know, Rasheed Wallace, for the hothead that he was, he seems to be having a good post-NBA life, you know. Um, Ben Wallace has moved on. You know, Ben Wallace is another great story. He came from Virginia Union. That was in the same athletic conference as Virginia State, Elizabeth City State, where I went, Division II. He made it all the way to the NBA. Uh, Mm -hmm. Charles Oakley also came out of that school. But Ben Wallace was able to get something done that – Charles Oakley didn't, which was winning an NBA championship. You know, so and I think when you experience winning, you're a winner for life because you can trans um pose that experience and that attitude to any endeavor that you ever take. You know, um guys like Reggie Jackson, guys like Dave Winfield, uh guys that play with the Oakland Raiders when they play, uh Howie Long does color commentary for NFL football. That guy still looked like he could put on a football uniform and go. Um, a, a guy like um, Strahan, who I'm not too much of a fan of, you know, but he was a great player with the Giants. And he has, you know, transported all the success and all of the positive energy. He's always presented, even in interviews as a football player, into doing the things that he does now in media you know and you can't take that away from him you know he has a winning smile he has a high attitude and he gets it done you know so but it's nice when you can do it for yourself and now you can get in a position where you can do it for others like i look at the situation in walmart you know um if i can get into higher levels of leadership i think i possess that ability to be able to move touch and inspire individuals and say hey you're here now but being here is awesome because everybody's not here and you're in the game. You're working, you know, you're um, gainfully employed, you're getting a check, you're able to take care of yourself, and you put one foot in front of the other, put a game plan in place for yourself, and you can really grow this opportunity for yourself. I mean, I've seen it with some of the leadership there, guys that have been there for 17, 23 years that have built careers at Walmart. I see it with young people now that are there going to school, working, and I, I try to have those conversations with them to help them see the bigger picture. Like, yeah, you know, I was where you were, you know, working, going to school, it looked like there was no end to it, but there really is. And, you know, there's a bright future. You know, some people become a little engaged when they realize that I'm involved with real estate. Oh, well, he does more than just Walmart, you know, we see him ride to Walmart on his bike, but he has this chipper attitude, but it's like, wow, um, he's involved in real estate and, 
you know, he's done different things. So he's a little older, but, you know, he's here, so there must be value in it. And I think that's how you get people involved in the process and and start feeling that sense of winning, you know, and even for myself to be able to impart to young people some information that help them realize that what they're doing has value and that that value can grow exponentially. So, uh, yeah, to answer that question, you know, there can be a happy ending after completing a goal, you know, be it if you just want to succeed at that goal or you want to use that goal now as a stepping stone to accept greater challenges, perhaps go after another goal of helping other people to achieve their goals. And you continue to win. You continue to win. You're right. And everything you said, it really helps me as a young as a young person. And this is where this is like the 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 last question I'm gonna ask you is like very the trouble one. As a young person, when you were in your twenties, like back then we had like a little bit of the mentality stage of acting and being like as a child, like why do we feel like time is running out for us to do something in our life do you ever have that feeling because i, I i've been having that feeling uh, you every know what i used to have that feeling somewhat you know um you know believe it or not i came from a free high achieving family you know my dad was a three-term mayor of kingston jamaica he was a business mogul in jamaica um in the betting and gambling industry he owned a lot of real estate down there he also owned real estate in america um I also was told he had some stuff over in England and maybe some of the other Caribbean islands as well. But I'm only familiar with what he had in Jamaica and in New York City. But at any rate, um, and I felt a lot of pressure because I had two older brothers that were attorneys and high-ranking members of government in Jamaica. So, and I really didn't have the benefit of my father's influence because he passed when I was seven. So really, it was on me to be whoever and whatever it was that I wanted to be. And I chose, I wanted to be a baseball player. That was something that my mom loved. That was something that connected me to her. But I think early on, I felt like I really pushed myself to be a a good baseball player. Like the, the talent was there, but the grooming and the coaching of the mastery of the fundamentals of the game wasn't there for me. And I really put it on myself and at one point I stopped playing the game but I knew that my real gift was really being a salesman I could sell anything you know and I knew that but I held on to the dream of wanting to be a baseball player and unfortunately I didn't play in high school because um you know other things in my life came up that seemed more important and I always thought I can get back to baseball but you see, but sometimes that's a mistake that we can make because that's the idea of youth being wasted on youth. We just think that we can just leave things and come back to it. But things have to be developed and you have to put the time into it. And so when the time came when maybe I was at an age where I should have already been drafted in baseball or should have got a college scholarship to play baseball at a high D1 level, I wasn't. You know, so I left the military early, went into college, and I forced my way into playing the game and it was always this sense of urgency of i'm behind i'm behind i'm behind and so much so that i got so focused on things that it made me miss out on some it, like it made me miss out on some opportunities it made me miss out on love because i thought that it had to be all about me and what i needed to do and what i wasn't getting done you know which brings about an imbalance you know um And that's bad, you know, so the thing is, I think the secret to us avoiding time running out, once you make up your mind what it is that you want to do, like you want to be honest with yourself and do it. And sometimes we may not get the support that we're looking for. Like, for example, I remember seeing my brother when I was about 16 in Jamaica. He was out of politics, but he was practicing law. He still had a big name on the island of Jamaica, so he was like a god. Whatever he said was like gospel. And it was crushing to me when my mother told him that I wasn't doing well in school, even though I was doing enough to get by. They felt like I needed to be an A student because that was the standard that was set. You know, my dad was this. He sent my brothers to this school, that school, but that wasn't in place for me. So really, 
and being that I was born in America in a different generation, you know, my brothers was born in the 30s. I was born in the 70s in America. You know, it's a different time, different experience. You know, so my thing is I'm a red-blooded American. We play sports, you know, and we love entertainment. So I was a marketing guy, and I was a baseball guy, you know. So, But they felt like, especially my one brother, like, oh, you're not working hard enough in school. You need to get education. You need to do this. You need to be thinking about that. It just totally blew my world. Instead of them looking at the aspect of, well, you know what? His father isn't here. I'm only his brother. He's not a bad kid because I grew up in the 80s. I wasn't involved in a lot of the negative things that was going on in the 80s, like drug selling and all that bad stuff. I did make it to school. You know, the evaluation should have been made that, you know what, he's a good kid. You know, his mom works on a sleepaway job. She's not there all the time. He lives with his aunt who sleeps, who works at night, so he's home at night by himself. You know, and he's doing the best he can. He's not getting into trouble. He goes to school, he comes home. The concession should have been made. Let's look at the circumstance. Let's look at what's in place and how we can support him and what he wants to do instead of discouraging what it is that I was doing. Like, oh, no, you don't need to play ball. You need to go to school. You need to study for the SAT and the LSAT and the this and the that. And you need to be this and that so I can be like them. No, I can't be like you because I'm not you. I'm me. And me want to play ball and go to school and, you know, be the joking clown that I was and the marketing sales convincing person I was. And that should have been recognized and encouraged. You know what? This is who he is. This is where he can excel. Let's support him in this. He likes business management and marketing. He happens to go to high school that does that. And he wants to play ball. You know what? Let's encourage him. You know what? Let's send him to a baseball camp. Let's give him a shot. Let's see if we can help him be a good enough student and a decent enough baseball player to at least maybe get that college scholarship. Let's see if we can get him that free four-year education. Who knows? Maybe maybe even he can get drafted to play pro ball. But let's see if we can put him on the path to get that marketing education that he so likes and desires and play ball. Because the worst that can happen is, is that he'll graduate from college with a four-year experience in playing ball, which will probably put him in a position to get a really great sales position somewhere and eventually get into management and maybe start his own business. So I think we young people, older people have to look at young people and recognize who they are, what they are, where they are, and how they can encourage them and support them and where they are so they can become who they need to become. So that way they don't feel that pressure of time is running out. What time is running out? The time that people have placed on you, or that you're placed on yourself because of because of because of because of a perception or a story that has been delivered to you about who you're supposed to be or who you should be, as opposed to who you are and who you want to be, and you can flower and develop into who you're going to be because that's who you are. You know, so you know there's a lot to evaluate there and look at. But ultimately, people are going to be who they want to be and who they are. And who they are and who they want to be should be encouraged. And I mean encouraged in a positive way. You know, because even the bad kid has that talent. How can we tap into that talent so we can now get him to be focused or her to be focused on the negative things that they may be, um, you know, involved in? that can now be put into a positive way. You know, because the negative times a negative is a positive. Even when a negative is divided by a negative, it's a positive. So how can we take what they may be negatively doing and find a thing that is a positive for them so we can get them to plug into that, feel and experience some success there so they can now bring that success to every aspect of their life. And that in baseball is what we call a four two, a five two player. Somebody that can throw, catch, run, hit, and hit for power. That's a complete baseball player. And in life, that's what we should all be striving to be. You know, a good individual, a good husband, a good father, a good relative, a good neighbor, a five two person. And their time will never run out on you because that's timeless. You're right. A five two player is a timeless accomplishment. It's timeless. Time never runs out on that. You're right. Time never runs out. And that, and honestly, 
met young people like myself, they we kind of like, you know, see our friends and getting like the most popularity, the most success and having a better life. And we like, damn, what, 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 in the, what the fuck we're doing with, with, with my life? Well, and that's the problem. Like, I, I kind of worry about other people, other people's shit. And like, I don't worry about what's, what's my, my, my term goes. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I also think one of the things that maybe really motivated you to want to have this conversation with me, because I know I introduced you to um, a, a website that I developed called MomsDads.org, and it kind of spoke about what I just spoke about with my baseball experience, you know, how I felt I wasn't being supported by that and all of that, you know, but I have since revamped the website because I didn't want to be so negative, because really at the end of the day, I could have taken ownership over what I wanted to do in spite of whatever people thought, but I didn't. But the thing that I do want to highlight about my upbringing is, is that along the way, I've always had people that loved and cared about me. And really that is what is carried today. And I think what we're talking about here sometimes may really be more um, of a dilemma for young people who may be growing up in single parent homes or without the influence of parents that can really help guide them and put them on the road to who it is that they need to be. So I really wanted to be more positive and upbeat, and which is why I revamped the website to really highlight how, yeah, I had a father that was an accomplisher. I had a mother that was loving and a hard worker, and I had family members and friends that stepped up to make sure that I was taken care of, you know, even when I didn't have both my parents there. You know, and um, to the best of my ability, I still went after what I wanted to go after, even though it may have been past that time for me to really flourish in that particular endeavor of, let's say, playing baseball, you know, coming out of high school, going into college. I still went after it, you know, like maybe 10 years later and went after it at a very high level because I was still being looked at by pro scouts. Like, people were really surprised. Like, he's this old, but, you know, for the game. But like, wow, look at him. He's really giving it up, and the passion is there. You know, so there was something I was still able to take away from that. I could take from that that, you know what? Never give up on yourself. Never waste time on yourself. Go after what you want, you know, with 100% passion and dedication and good things will come to you. So I think that's why I can look at the Walmart opportunity and I can go after it the way I, I go after it because I realize that I'm just not in a store, but I'm a part of a multinational corporation where the opportunities are really endless and it's really on me. You know, I, I can really shine. I can really be who and all that I want to be because I know what it feels like to go after something and get it and win, even though I may be coming to the game a little late in life. You know, you figure... Mm -hmm. Where I am now in the position that I am is an entry-level position for a person that's in school. But it's all right because, you know, in martial arts, I'm taught everyone starts at the bottom. You know, everyone must train. And um, I forget the other motto that my sensei gives. Everyone starts at the bottom. Everyone must train. And, um, I, you know, but basically that's the mentality. So even though I'm 50 years old now, I can still come in with that ground floor opportunity and turn it into what I want because I understand that you have to start somewhere and not only do you have to start somewhere, but you have to give it a hundred percent and you have to keep a positive attitude. You always have to think about the next person. How can you also motivate them and help them to see the opportunity and what it is that they're doing so they can take their game to the next level. And collectively that's how everyone wins, you know? So, you know, time really never runs out. You know, in the more science Temple of America, the very, very first sentence of the Holy Quran in the more science Temple of America says, time never was when man was not, and a time will come when man will end. And then in that instance, that's when time runs out for you, literally when your life ends. So time really never runs out, you know, but there's a maximum time to get things done, you know, because if I had really been about my business in high school, of playing baseball and getting that education that I needed to maybe get me into a D1 school or to maybe get drafted into a baseball minor league system, then I could have had a bigger outcome, you know, but then maybe I would have missed out on some of the other opportunities. Maybe I would have missed out on a young lady that I met when I was a true freshman that loved the daylights out of me. 
but I was too big headed to not see and understand what love was at that time. And I thought it was all about me and all about what I needed to go after because I was going to let love get in the way of me being who and what I needed to be. Coupled with, let me see if I can experience love with a whole bunch of other beautiful women as well. Instead of recognizing, wow, this is love and this may not always come around again. You know, being able to recognize a winning situation when you see it and to say, I need to work with this. And this can be a part of what I'm going after. You know, maybe if I had, um, you know, taken more full advantage of opportunities in high school, you know, and had been more self-expressed and love myself and my experiences, then I would have recognized that that was a part of the equation for me, that I needed that and that I needed to work with that because in the seventh inning stretch or the final innings of the game or even in the extra innings, you know, which could have been a marriage now of maybe 30 years or at least over 20 years. And then we start talking about 50 years of marriage and you're talking about folks like George Bush Sr. who was married for like 74 years before he passed and his wife passed. Now, I mean, you know, listen, we're talking extra innings now. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, we're talking that's great territory that's not charted by many and that's special you know but it all starts somewhere and believing that where we are is good enough and what we have is good enough even if you feel people have more or or doing better what you have available is good enough and you can still grow it into what it is that you want it to be you can still create whatever it is that you want to create because what we don't know is what we don't know but what we do know we need to go after and make it work until it works for us. And guess what? It's never too late. Exactly. It's never too late, whether you're never. young young and old. There's exactly. n- it's never too late to find love. It's never too late to start your own to start your own thing, your own business, exactly. or your own brand. It's never too late to step up. Right. And then, you know, fortunately, you know, even if you you're so called approaching it late you still have a lot of experience to glean from to make it even just that better to know what to do and what not to do so i mean because you're going to express you know because you're going to experience failures and disappointments along the line but now maybe that you have experienced failures and disappointments and other endeavors you now know what to expect in this endeavor that you're now pursuing and you will not be deterred and you will move towards the end goal and reasonably in life, the older you get is the more closer you should be to what it is that you know that you want. So if you sign up, do it, you should know that this really what I'm doing now is really for the duration of my life. And I bring a, a life experience with me to be able to know the ups and downs and the ebbs and flows, you know, like Kentucky fried chicken, Colonel Sanders didn't hit it too late in his life, but he had had enough ups and downs and failures to understand this is what comes with life and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to fry some chicken and sell it and win, lose, or fail. I know that ebbs and flows come with it, but this is what I'm passionate about. This is what I'm going to do. And that's why today you have Kentucky Fried Chicken because of an individual's ups and downs and failures and wins and victories and disappointments prior that he was able to put into the endeavor that's still around today known as Kentucky Fried Chicken. But even the story about Abraham Lincoln running for elected office many, many, many times, but, you know, eventually becoming president and probably being one of the most consequential U.S. presidents and being able to keep the union together. Mm -hmm. Or even a guy like Donald Trump, who's heavily disliked by many, who has experienced ups and downs in business, you know, was up, was down, came back, became a U.S. president, whether you like his policies or not. You know, he was able to ascend to the highest office of the land. You know, some people were happy with, with, with his performance, me being one of them. And, you know, some are happy that he's gone. I'm not, you know, because I really think that he's a true Horatio, you know, Horatio, um, Horatio I'll, I'm, I'm forgetting the guy's name. He's really someone that is really a tree. Alga Horatio, I think is the name, you know, someone that has really gone after things, experienced the ebbs and flows and got to the top levels of life to try to impact the lives of others. Mm -hmm. He's a populist president, you know, people that did not feel a part 
of the political process that now felt that they were part of the political process. He brought voters, first time voters to the process that were never involved prior to the process and he put them in the process and made them feel empowered. And, you know, they uh, exercise their constitutional rights and being a part of that process and, and feeling part and parcel of the political system and looking to benefit from it. You know, that in itself is an achievement. You know, I mean, for what it's worth, he got 10 million more votes than he did four years ago. So he brought more voters to the rolls, you know, so for good, bad, or different or worse, you know, that's a perspective to be taken. And now he's moved on with his life for this segment, you know, back to what he knows, real estate and entertainment. Um, and to be seen if he'll run again in 2024 or, or if he'll help groom someone else come out of the Republican ranks to challenge for the White House in 2024. I mean, it's, it's a great legacy, you yeah. know? So, um, so there's always winning and there's never time running out. You know, it may be different phases of the game. You could probably win the game early, or you can win it in the middle, or you can win it at the end. You know, is it better to win early? Is it better to win in the middle, or is it better to win late? <sighs> you know, Tom Brady just won the Super Bowl on his way out. Mm -hmm. um, John Elway did the same thing. He's going to be remembered as winners, you know. Um, you know, everyone is talking about, you know, Brady as being the greatest quarterback of all times, but he lost to Eli Manning twice, you know, hmm. to uh, a subpar Giants team that managed to get into the Super Bowl. Overrated, you know? overrated. <laughs> yeah, overrated you know, team. so he has seven championships. He could have had nine. You know, I happen to think Joe Montana, for me, is one of the greatest all-time quarterbacks. Every time he went, he won. <laughs> hmm. You know, so... um but at the end of the day, uh, you know, Tom Brady is going to be known as a winner because he went out as a winner and he went out against one of the top young quarterbacks at present, Pat Mahomes. You know, so he went out a winner. You and, know? And, um, and I think Pat Malone has to learn from that, bro. Like, even though, yeah. he, even though the game was, like, one-sided, yeah. that experience going against, like, the an all-time, like, like Tom Brady and his experience, and his he even just even when he like you know traded or went to the um, to Tampa Bay, he brought that team to the championship like he did the, with with New 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 England, and the young and the young team like the like the like the Chiefs, they have to learn from that experience because you never know they might come back again next year or what are you after? Yeah, They'll be better. You know, I, yeah, I was upset when Tom Brady beat my guy up in Seattle. Um, uh, Pete Wilson, uh, uh, Wilson, uh, Wilson, Russell Richard, Wilson. Russell's I love, yeah. I love Russell Wilson. I love Russell Wilson. Wilson, you know, but you know, Pete Carroll made an idiot play call that cost him the game, and Tom Brady was on his way to losing, and he won, and and so it goes, you know. Um, Pat Holmes has nothing to be ashamed of, you know. There's nothing but up for him. You know, funny Pat Holmes. I remember when Pat Holmes used to come to the Mets clubhouse in Roosevelt Fillmore with his father, Pat Mahomes Sr., when he played for the Mets, and they were living in Forest Hills, New York. I, you know, you couldn't have told me that this toddler was going to grow up, become this insanely talented athlete that he is. But, you know, his father was a great athlete, so, and it manifested itself. But, you know, he could always chalk it off as, hey, you know, I ran up a one, I ran up against one of the all time greats, and, uh, I'm in the early innings of my career, and um, there's going to be some more opportunities for me to win, and it's all good. I take my helmet off, and I'm headed to football camp in the summer, and Tom Brady is going to be uh, off doing something else. It is what it is. I mean, on some levels, it would have been sad if Brady had lost to the young Mahomes because it would have been like, wow, you know, old guy got beat up on. You know, kind of like Ali getting beat up on Holmes, beat up by Holmes. It's like, wow, maybe he came one too many times to the well. But it's always good to see the older guy who's been putting in the work all these years, won a Super Bowl in three, in three decades, go out a winner. 
It's a nice mm-hmm. thing. And, um, you know, and Pat Mahomes, if he sticks, along, sticks around long enough, he'll be that Tom Brady, you know, into his 20th season or so and um, see how it goes. You know, but um, there's always a season, and in that season there's always an opportunity to win. You know, um, you got the summer, winter, fall, spring. You know, spring seems nice. It's the beginning. Summer is beautiful because it's blooming and everything is out and nature at its best. The sun is out and then you get into autumn where things are starting to retreat. Then you get into winter when things are slow and have gone into retreat. You know what I mean? And, um, and that spells the end, you know? So, uh, you know, which season do we want to win in? Which season, you know, people work hard in the summer of their life so they can enjoy the winter of their life. And I think that's the point that we all got to get, you know? Let's figure out early in the spring what the hell we're doing. Let's go into the summer. Let's harvest big, you know, to have a big harvest in the fall so we can relax and enjoy the winter. And I think that's the summation of our life. And that's the business we need to be about. Right. You're absolutely right. Frank, you got to think, tell me, do you want to be a most emotional, um, motivational um, speaker or write a book? <laughs> Not because yeah, you... I used, yeah, I used to think about that a lot. I used to um, read a lot of Les Brown and, you know, Tony Robbins and Tom Chambers and stuff like that because I knew I was a salesperson and I got off on stuff like that. I love being motivated. I, I love hearing the you know, the high sell pitches and the motivational speeches and things like that, and especially being involved in sports. I remember selling um, TV, voice, and internet services for Charter Spectrum, and I had a sales manager that was, you know, a highly motivated guy, you know, former military guy like myself, and, and we kind of had that same understanding of how to go after things and just let's 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 let's, let's just get it done. <laughs> you know, like like Trump at a Trump rally. That's motivation at a high level. You know, like let's listen, let's get the message out, let's fire people up, let's get it done, let's win. You know, um, that also comes from a sports mentality. You know, so um, yeah, I you know I love motivating people or. Um, or it's something that I learned in Landmark Worldwide, you know, helping people transform, you know, because we all have something, but how can we take it and make it work for us? So that's a transformation, you know, because no one is really going to change. You really can't change who people are, but you can help them to transform, you know, kind of like that caterpillar. You can't change a caterpillar, but it transforms into a butterfly. You know, it's still the same entity, but it's transforming into something else. You know, one moment it's crawling on its belly, then it cocoons up, then it comes out of cocoon as a beautiful butterfly. That's a transformation. You know, because it's the same entity, so you're not changing it, but you're transforming it. So yeah, I definitely take delight in transformational work. You know, with myself and seeing it happen with other people. No, I absolutely agree. Frank, thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. And, and also, you taught me a lot. Like, there's no finish line. There's, there's always more. And you have to you, you have to be teaching to some other young people, like, other than myself, how, how life is, how life can be hard, how, how, like, um, we can pursue more instead of, instead of waiting or, or um, hoping. It's like a game, though. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's an unlimited game that will be... That they'll go on over and over again. And I appreciate it. And I appreciate this, this conversation we had, though. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for considering me. And thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank All you right. so much. God bless and Godspeed, bro. God bless. You too. After listening to Mr. Spalding Bay, at his age, he's done it all. 
and still looking and pursuing for more. Such as, you know, working as commercial real estate broker at Broker and Associate, a salesman at Walmart, which I am proud to work with. And he also created his own organization known as Mom and Dads, if you heard, to help kids to succeed in academic and sports life. And if you want to know more about it, check the site, momsanddads.org.